Picture your favorite parasite. What's the first thing you think of when you hear the word parasite? If I had to guess, you're picturing something that looks like a worm. Or maybe you're thinking of a creature so small you need a microscope to see it. What if I told you that some of the most interesting parasites, in my opinion, don't fit into one of those two boxes? Hi, my name is Jana and I'm a senior biology student at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Welcome to the first episode of my series, Not Your Average Parasite. In this series, we'll challenge our ideas of what makes a parasite a parasite by looking at some super cool and borderline freaky examples of unique parasites. If we're going to challenge the stereotypes of parasites, we should probably start by developing a working definition of what a parasite is. A parasite is an organism that infects another organism, called a host, and derives a benefit from it. The host itself is harmed. Parasites can live either in or on their hosts, but the most important thing is that the host is harmed by the parasite in some way. Our first example is definitely not your average parasite. They aren't microscopic and they don't look like worms. This parasite flies. And chances are, if you have ever been in a tomato garden in the summer, you've seen what this parasite does to its victims. Today, we're looking at the parasitoid wasps. Scary, right? So what exactly is a parasitoid wasp? Most of us are familiar with wasps, and we know they're insects. But how are parasitoid wasps classified biologically? To answer that question, let's take a look at their taxonomy. For those of you who aren't familiar with taxonomy, it's basically how biologists name, describe, and classify organisms. There are seven main taxonomic ranks. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. For starters, wasps are animals, so they're in the animal kingdom. They're in the phylum arthropods and the class insects. Within the insects, wasps are in the order Hymenoptera. This order includes other insects such as ants and bees, which are some of the closest relatives of wasps. There are multiple families of parasitoid wasps in the Hymenoptera, but two of the biggest are the Braconidae and the Ichneumonidae. So where do these parasitoid wasps live? Well, the short answer is pretty much everywhere. Except, of course, Antarctica. That's pretty much just reserved for penguins. Scientists used to think that the species diversity of one family of parasitoid wasps, the Ichneumonidae, was the highest in temperate regions, which are places that are not tropical. This is the opposite of how it usually is, because usually the highest diversity for any species is in tropical areas, like the Amazon rainforest. However, recent research has shown that there actually is a lot more diversity of parasitoid wasp species in these tropical areas than they previously thought. The title of this series is Not Your Average Parasite, so we need to talk about how these wasps behave like parasites. But before we get into that, let's lay out the difference between an organism being parasitic and being parasitoid. Something that is parasitic must live its entire life inside a host, and it cannot survive without it. Something that is parasitoid, however, does spend a significant amount of its life in a single host, but then it leaves the host and has a free living period of existence. Our wasp friends fall into that second category. The targets of parasitoid wasps are typically Lepidoptera larvae. That's a fancy way to say moth and butterfly caterpillars. There are also wasp species that target other life stages of moths and butterflies, beetle or fly larvae, and even spiders. Finding a host is crucial for the wasp to carry out its life cycle since it serves as a food source for the wasp's larvae. The wasps can find host by feeling vibrations in the air and looking around in the environment. Most importantly, the wasps can find hosts through chemical signals. For example, wasps can pick up on lepidopteran sex pheromones, which are like chemicals that the insects can smell. They can also pick up on compounds that plants release into the air when they are suffering herbivory from something like a caterpillar. The plant releases these signals when it has something eating it. Then the wasp can pick up the signal and use it to find the culprit that it can parasitize. As we can see in this video, once the female wasp has located a victim, she paralyzes it, and then lays her eggs inside of it with a structure called an ovipositor. The eggs then grow and eventually hatch into larvae. The larvae feed on the host tissues until ready to pupate. By now, the host is either dead or almost dead. The larvae either eat their way out of the host and then pupate, or do so within the empty skin of the host. The wasps eventually emerge as adults to start the cycle over again. So why is it important to learn about these wasps? 
Most species don't have stingers, so they aren't a threat to humans. In fact, they might even be beneficial. Parasitoid wasps have the potential to be used as biological controls that are safe, sustainable, and effective at reducing insect pest populations. Since this would eliminate the use of chemicals, there would be no risk of resistance like with insecticides. Thanks for watching the first episode of Not Your Average Parasite. Today we talked about the parasitoid wasps. If you think about it, what these wasp larvae do to their host is kind of like the real life version of the famous scene from the movie Alien. In our next episode, we'll talk about another strange, outside the box parasite that plays a really freaky role inside the mouth of its host. I'm Jana, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.